Welcome to a fantastic edition of Rebellion's Educational Series. I'm here with two brilliant mathematicians, Alexander Denev and Saeed Amen. I've been following both of these minds for a decade plus. And recently, I have been so impressed with Turnleaf Analytics, the firm they started, which has been correctly predicting inflation rates around the world. Super awesome. Guys, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Alexander, for inviting us. Thank you. So first, let's cut to the chase. Can you discuss the style of machine learning you've been using to make these correct predictions? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if I can step back a, a, a little bit. So we worked, say, then I on alternative data and alternative data has been floating around as a term for many, many years, uh, but only lately seeing, seeing applications. And so to your point, Alexander, it's naturally wedded to, to machine learning. And I'll explain why it's wedded to machine learning. So we live in an information-rich world. There are a lot of data sets. And personally, Sid and I work in more than 300 different data sources. So it's a big deal of information out there. And if you think how, uh, at least in econometrics, things have been done up to now, it's applying very simple linear model to very few uh, data sets. Uh, whether it has worked or not, there is a lot of papers documenting failures of econometric models during especially the great, great, uh, great financial crisis. Uh, so if we have many data sources, the big question is what to do if classical linear uh, models do not work. Okay, And so this is how we approach the problem. You know, we want to predict something, a macroeconomic variables. We have all these data sources. How can we make the most of it? when classical methods do not work. So we examine different methods, you know, on, on, especially on the web, there are many propositions and papers, what machine learning to apply uh, uh, to get most of many data sources ranging from deep learning. Uh, we're, hearing, uh, we're hearing agent-based uh, theory as well. Uh, we prefer to settle uh, for something that, uh, that's uh, more simple, but it's a technique that helps us to deal with many, many uh, uh, data sources. Especially, as I said, we have around 300 data sources, very few observations. If you consider 15, 20 years of data, you have 200 observations, monthly observations. So it's difficult, uh, you know, to find the most appropriate technique to, to, to deal with this, uh, uh, with this multitude of data sources. We looked at different techniques. Uh, we believe uh, regularization techniques like Lasso and Rich, they, they, they were pretty fine. They're able uh, to see through the noise and tell out of these 300 data sources, what are the most important ones, the most important variables. And they help us doing it in a dynamic way. This is the, the, the important point. What was important many years ago, it's no longer relevant. COVID data sources were very important for the last three years. They're becoming less and less relevant, we are seeing a lot of geopolitical variables spiking up. So what we, we needed really is a technique that uh, is able to accommodate in a dynamic way, uh, you know, the dynamic nature of markets, dynamic nature of data sources uh, uh, themselves. So yes, machine learning is, is a natural candidate uh, to deal uh, with these sorts of problem. But again, we prefer to, prefer something than simpler rather than really uh, uh, escalate, let's say, so to, to more complex uh, techniques. Uh, you, you know, that what we can say, and maybe this is relevant uh, to the problem at hand, a machine learning te technique and, you know, a uh, uh, technique in your audience surely knows that depends on the context, you know, to which you apply this uh, machine learning technique. What we notice in uh, macroeconomics, of course, we deal with highly nonlinear environment. And not always historical data is representative of the future. So what is the technique that is able to accommodate these two things plus the many data, uh, data sources? So we devised an algorithm that is able to, uh, to treat nonlinearities. It is also an algorithm that's able to extrapolate because if you take the classical random forest, yes, it can cope with, with nonlinear nonlinearities in the data, but it's not able to, to extrapolate. So how to, given the problem at hand, how to devise uh, an algorithm that is able to cope with all these peculiarities of, uh, of machine learning, which are not the same as, let's say, in language translation. There you have more stationary environment. Uh, languages don't change that often. So you don't need to have this uh, dynamically adapting machine learning technique. You rather set up for more, uh, more kind of static machine. Learning. So given our domain, 
uh, we, we, we're choosing a combination of uh, uh, can be AJ boost, uh, uh, random force, but also uh, a linear, linear uh, techniques on the top of it to be able to cope with, with extrapolation. Uh, and sometimes, you know, this it's a very simple technique that we think works well in economics. And sometimes it's, it's very much overlooked because, you know, many data scientists, we like deep learning, you want to apply it everywhere. Uh, but, you know, it might work in, uh, in various circumstances, but, you know, when you try to build something and you want to sell something, you want your clients to understand why these are the predictions. They have a lot, a lot of questions. Okay, inflation is going to be up in the next 12 months, but why are you able to explain this to us? So we had a lot of constraints uh, within which to operate to choose the best uh, the best technique that we're using. Mm -hmm. well, there's this big debate about reinforcement learning versus deep learning and which one is more efficient for uh, financial predictions. And so I'd love uh, your thoughts on that. Well, I was going to say we haven't delved into that too much for our for our use case, uh, essentially. So I think potentially those types of discussions might be uh, best where you have a lot of data. So in our case, um, like Alex was mentioning, in terms of the number of observations we have, we have like monthly observations, maybe 15, 20 years, potentially. So whilst we have a lot of, uh, lot of features, obviously, uh, several hundred at, at least for, for each country, um, the actual number of data point is actually relatively small. Uh, my own feeling, although I, I'm not an expert in, in this area, is if, if you delve more into to high frequency uh, environments, uh, in those instances, obviously you have a very rich data, so you've got order book data as, as well. Potentially there having, uh, having techniques like uh, deep neural nets or, or doing re reinforcement learning to kind of find, find the best rule could potentially be appropriate, but it, it's not something that we've, we've looked at in our case. I think our main focus has been to, to kind of, as just to, to lead on from what Alex was saying, to try and find models which kind of work with the data, but at the same time, nothing too too complicated, essentially, which, which has become complex to, to explain to clients, because ultimately, a lot of our, our clients are uh, discretionary fund managers, economists, um, it's not necessarily always uh, a data scientists. So for them, the the explainability part, I think, is that that seems to be crucial. They they always want to know why is our forecast uh, this stuff, and and that's that's fair enough actually. Because I, with my markets hat, I always want to know why, uh, essentially. So um, it's important to view it not only as a data science problem, but also as a as a markets problem uh, yeah. at, at the same time. I mean, you two have spent so much time on data. It's it's just so impressive. I mean, you, you two have written the book, really, on, on how to understand uh, data in you know, the modern world. Yeah, yeah I, it, you're right. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, no, go. <laughs> yeah. The, the problem is we're not in the same room, so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, what what I would say, it, it, you said the right word, data. Uh, so we experimented uh, with different algorithms, starting from simple to intermediate, but as I said, mentioned, we didn't venture into to, to for enforcement learning. But uh, what we noticed is, yes, you can complicate the algorithm and your accuracy increases. That, that's true. These algorithms have been devised uh, for this purpose exactly. But what is the most important thing is the data. Sometimes we can see a, a, an increase of accuracy when we change the model, like two, 3%. Yeah, it increases, use a more complicated the model, we gain 3% in accuracy. But sometimes if you find the right data source, all of a sudden you include it in the model, you, you get an increase of accuracy of 20%. So we focus more on the right data sources, more simple models to get inside, rather insights rather than to to just use few data sources in very, very complex models. So uh, the operating word in, in our line of business is get the right data rather than fine tune the most complex model possible. So the, the, this is our philosophy and so far it's, it's worked. Uh, you know, that many people missed uh, inflation starting from last year, you know, especially some central banks, there have been a lot of articles uh, and why, why they failed. Uh, we, we started predicting this increase in inflation long ago, uh, more than one year ago. It's because we are not better than the rest. We are not uh, better modelers than, you know, there, there are several good economics and quant team in, in, in banks, but we got access to the right data 
earlier than anybody else. So this, this was kind of the secret of why we, we were able to pick up inflation uh, rising. And, and, that, and I think a, a crucial element as well as having the right data is to be able to clean it and to, to kind of uh, do the right transformations as well. So there's so many times when we've got data sets and like they've been rebased or there's change of change of the way they measure it and so on and so forth. So you really need to make sure that your data set is properly clean and, and properly transformed. And that's that's difficult, I think. <laughs> that is the most complicated part of it. So sometimes it's not obvious when you get a data set where there are problems. Um, and I'd say for every country as well, there needs to be a bit of domain specific knowledge as well. So it's it's not a pure data science problem. Essentially, if we're modeling, say, inflation in some, somewhere like Chile, we need to understand what the economy is like there. So then let's say copper mining is a big industry there. So yeah. we need to basically be, have that in, in our model. Uh, whereas, say, other countries, uh, the data sets are going to be quite different. So if you think of South Africa, again, mining is important, but it's not so much copper. It's, it's gold and, and other uh, precious metals. So, um, and, and the key is there also differentiating as well. So you tend to have different variables in developed markets versus emerging markets as well. Um, and this is something key that I've learned over history, that you really need to have a, a tailored approach, essentially. Um, you don't want to have exactly the same uh, data and models for every single country. So I, I remember back to my days working in, in banks. So uh, seeing people have models for developed market FX and trying to immediately transpose it to emerging markets. And it kind of doesn't it doesn't really work. You need to have kind of a, a tailored, a tailored approach. Um, although these days, I guess it's, it's kind of worrying. Some developed market currencies appear to be <laughs> behaving like emerging markets. So. Uh, it's uh, it's kind of an interesting world. Yeah, no, it, it really is an interesting world. And inflation has become the primary thought on most Americans' minds. It, it's amazing. It, it went from a back burner issue to the top issue of the day. And do you see other countries that people haven't started talking about yet that are going to see more inflationary issues going forward? Uh, yeah, inflation has always been a problem in, in emerging markets. What, what we're seeing in, in developed markets, it's quite rare, at, at least compared to, to the last 30 years of uh, uh, history. So it's been a, a surprise to many. But in emerging markets, you know, this is kind of the norm. And emerging markets, there is more investments going on. This why people were asking about inflation. And uh, yeah, uh, there is something called, you know, market consensus and economist consensus that you, you can collect and, and understand, you know, what what... Well, what is the expectation on inflation? And, you know, we've been using those as well as input uh, uh, to our models. But, you know, sometimes we find discrepancy. And this is now, we were saying last year, inflation going to spike and happen, although the economist's expectation was that inflation would be tamed very early uh, days. And yeah, we're seeing some inflationary uh, pressures now. So U.S. has already felt this, this kind of uh, uh, a spike of inflation. And, you know, given the recent policies and, uh, the trend is downwards for, for U.S. inflation, although with, with some persistency. Uh, we see, for example, inflation pressures in India at, at the moment, although this is not the market expectation at, at the moment we are seeing that. And there is a lot of investments going on in India and in fixed income. So this is an important question. And, you know, it's one of the top five economies nowadays, Cindy. So people are trying to understand how, how inflation uh, will behave there. And we see a lot of uh, you know, inflation pressure due to, to geopolitical risks there in, in that country. So not always we are in line with what the economy says, but, you know, we just uh, trust the data. You know, sometimes you, we are biased. You no, know, we think economist thing is going down. We are saying up. No, that's not possible. But we're not overriding the motors because there's really so many variables interacting that, you know, can, some of them can escape human's mind. They cannot be like understood by a human mind, but the machine there can really uh, cope with 300 variables and extract some patterns. So yes, we see some inflationary pr uh, pressures there. We, you, you're starting so, to observe also inflation pressure uh, pressures uh, uh, in, in Japan. Recently, you know, it's been traditionally a place for very, very low or negative inflation, but for now it hit 3% uh, last month, which is very, very rare for that uh, country. And we, we see this continuing this trend. So yes, uh, inflation pressures uh, uh, have not died yet. Uh, certain countries are, are more sensitive than others, especially the ones in Eastern Europe, but 
this also because of the geopolitical component what is happening now in, in eastern europe and uh, with gas prices and, and and so on so what we're seeing is the world behaving in different regimes with regards to inflation and we of course observe different trends in the future according to the country this has been a lot of fun i'd also like our viewers to know about the book you two wrote uh, can you can you quickly tell our viewers about the book you two wrote together yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, Alexander and I, we, we've known each other, I guess it must be nearly 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and Alex came to me and suggested uh, uh, writing this book, although I, I remember you got the idea from, from Marcos, I think, at, at the time. Marcos uh, Lopez de Prado, yeah. He, he yeah, so we, it, was, it was because of him, actually, we wrote the book, yeah. his, his idea originally. So, um, yeah, we wrote about alternative data, because I don't think that there was a, like a, a single volume book on alternative data, like what it is, how do you use it? What type of machine learning techniques you, you apply? And also we had lots of different case studies uh, in it as well. But I guess the, the key part of the book is we want to have a general approach to using alternative data within the financial context, as opposed to just talking about specific data sets, although that was that was part of it. So um, because the, the market is moving so quickly with new data sets all the time, we wanted to have something there, which was uh, kind of would stand the, the test of time. And, Definitely for me, I got the opportunity to work with so many different alternative data sets. It kind of broadened uh, my thoughts about the subject. And I think because of that book, we 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 ended up starting later on Turn Leaf Analytics. So I think, um, yeah, at the time, I didn't, I never imagined we'd, we'd end up starting a company doing inflation forecasting, but it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was the start of all this. So I'm glad uh, I, I worked with Alex on, on the book. So it's, uh, it, it was a fun endeavor, but a lot of work. I'm sure you'll you'll agree. Anyone who's written a book always says they'll never write another one. But uh, yeah, I always swear. I, <laughs> so. I always swear this is going to be my last book, and it's you know I always write another one, but you know this time I swear because uh, one thing is um, Alexander, you know, was I had a lot of learnings from that book or uh, co-writing it with say it and we gather different you know evidence around the world about alternative data, the process around the alternative data. Uh, we had personal experience on alternative data, but we managed to put all this ensemble of things into something that's now uh, really practical and it's, it's not just theory. And, you know, you read a lot of scientific papers, you know, different algorithms are compared and the conclusion of the paper is, I don't know, uh, deep learning is the best among these techniques for these specific problems. But one thing is to do a horse racing in a paper. Another thing is to operate uh, we are operating 360 models for different countries at the moment, and there is a lot of technology. So it's not just a theoretical exercise. We calibrate the model, you know, it beats the market. We, that's the end of the story. There are a lot of practicalities around running this machine, as it mentioned, data cleansing in real time. Certain data sources disappear, so we must have algorithms at the early stage to detect that something is going wrong with with, with the data. So, so uh, at least you know. From, from writing a book to really applying all, all these things in, 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 into practice, that there's a long way. And you see, then I walk this way. And, you know, mm -hmm. uh, at least from my point of view, we need to write the seed another edition of this book, all these learnings for the last past years, you know, and the world has moved a lot. So soon uh, we might write uh, another edition, although I swore that, you know, that might be uh, my last book, at least for me. But uh, it's, it's really fascinating and fast evolving world, and uh, we'll see more to come, I think, in the future. Uh, as our views change on the world, our desires for writing differ, and so we want to you know, espouse different views, and hence the need for new books. And I look forward to discussing with you guys your next book when it does come out, TBD. In the meantime, I hope our viewers will go to Turnleaf Analytics' website and look at the work of Saeed and Alexander. Really exquisite stuff. I, I've seen some of their inflationary predictions and I've been extremely impressed. So uh, congratulations, gentlemen, and I look forward to talking again. Thank you, Alexander. Thanks, Thank you. thanks for your time and thanks for the invitation. Yeah. Always a pleasure to speak. Thank you for your time. Bye.